The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone to the Rebel Capitalist Show that I have really looked forward to speaking with. And I know all of my listeners and viewers have really looked forward to hearing from this gentleman as well. He really needs no introduction. He is Professor Richard Werner. Professor, thank you for being on the Rebel Capitalist Show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your show and to talk to you. All right. So most of my viewers are going to know your your backstory. So I really want to dive into the meat of the conversation. And uh, they also, well, hopefully they realize that you really invented the term or phrase quantitative easing way, way, way back in the day. So and you did so to describe what the Bank of Japan was doing or, or trying to do with the Japanese economy after they went through the big stock market bust and the real estate crash in uh, 1990, going into the early 1990s. So could you describe or, or tell us why or how you came up that with that term, why it's descriptive and why the Japanese quantitative easing may differ from what we've seen in the United uh, yeah. States and with the ECB? Yes, well, thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so this was over a quarter century ago. Um, I was uh, in Tokyo, chief economist of Jardine Fleming Securities Asia uh, in Tokyo, British investment bank, which later became part of JP Morgan. Um, and I had uh, already, you know, when I arrived there with them um, in, in early 1994, uh, pointed out that um, there's a big problem because this goes back to my earlier forecast on Japan, which was um, back in 1991, published back at Oxford, where I, was, I had been doing my doctorate. There's a paper, discussion paper, Oxford Institute of Economics and Statistics, University of Oxford, uh, that I put out in October 1991. And you have to remember in, in 91, you know, this sort of set the scene, um, people were still in the mood of the 80s and, you know, Japanese money flooding the world and Japan, you know, the Japanese century. And, and, and they're saying by the dip. <laughs> yeah. And, and well, 89 was, of course, the peak of the, of the stock market. And so 1991, the stock market had already fallen, but the economy was still going strong at 7% GDP growth. Mm. and clearly was very strong so you know what's the problem buy the dip exactly you know buy those really attractive japanese stocks they've come down but clearly you know japan is going to power ahead particularly since in 91 the bank of japan lowered interest rates for right. the first time the magic um variable that everyone is watching interest rates so all the, the global asset allocators and you know investment strategists were saying well buy Japanese stocks really pile in now They're, they've just started a cycle of interest rate reductions and the economy is so strong um, that's when I put out my paper back at Oxford October 91 and I came to very different conclusions namely uh, Japanese banks are likely to go bankrupt despite the fact that the world's top 20 banks were Japanese measured by assets you know um, they're going to go bankrupt and Japan is likely to move into the biggest recession since the Great Depression uh, so sell sell Japanese stocks. <laughs> right. I, I myself got a put option on the Nikkei at the time when I put this out in 91. And that was the background. So it was pretty bearish on Japan. Um, and by the time I arrived as, as chief economist at Jardine Fleming Securities, I was more interested in the question of how we're going to get out of the mess that is going to unfold. And I had no, no doubts that the mess was going to unfold. And so I placed more emphasis on, on that question, uh, which was a bit ahead of its time because everyone else was still thinking, you know, actually it's not so bad and it's going to recover slightly delayed, maybe the stock market recovery, but, you know, it's still a strong economy. What's the problem? And to me, it was clear that the banking system was going to freeze up and therefore the right monetary policy was going to be key. The right central bank action was going to be key. At, now, at this time, Richard, had the BOJ done anything other than lower rates? 
No, no, just they lowering rates. Expanded rate. their balance sheet at this time. No, just lowering rates, which okay. you know, to most um, analysts and economists, seem to be the most important thing to do. Um, but I came out arguing that uh, lowering rates, and they were around five percent by that time, was not going to help. You can lower them to zero. I was trying to be dramatic, and it's not going to help. <laughs> Little did I think the Bank of Japan was going to try to work hard to prove me right on that one. I mean, they could have skipped that one. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, so I was proposing policies to get out of a massive banking uh, freeze up that was gonna derail the economy and was gonna create a great depression. Now, because monetary policy was key and I was going to talk about stimulatory monetary policy, I realized that the moment I just mentioned that much on a, on a very high level, the misunderstandings would, would, would start because, oh, monetary policy, oh, you mean more interest rate reductions? <laughs> Everyone would think that. No, 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 it's not about the price of money. It's not about the interest rates. Right. So you had to get people away from that as the first thing you say. And that's why quantitative had to be you know, the, the first word when, when, when introducing my proposal. But then that wasn't enough. If you just say, no, it's the quantity of money, the quantity of the right type of money, the right type of the money supply or oh, money supply. Oh yes, we know that M1, M2, M3, or you're a monetarist. All right, that's what it's all about. No, <laughs> that's not what it's about because the trouble is that these standard monetarist money aggregates, money supply aggregates, M1, M2, M3, which the central banks publish. Well, sometimes they stop publishing them. Yeah, right. <laughs> but they used to publish them anyway. Um, that's not really the most interesting variable on the quantity side either. So even that would uh, create misunderstandings. And that's why I realized you'd need a new expression because I'm talking about something else, namely the quantity of credit creation. And if you want to be more precise, for GDP growth, you need to look at the quantity of credit creation used for GDP transactions. Right. Um, and actually, um, you know, th all this came out, came out when I was asked by the Nikkei, the Nihon Keizai Shimbun, the leading uh, Japanese newspaper, which is a financial newspaper daily, which now owns the Financial Times as well, abbreviated Nikkei, hence the Nikkei index is like the FTSE index, you know, from Financial Times. Um, and so, um, the Nikkei asked me to produce an article um, on my proposals. And I actually initially was going to have a headline saying, well, we need an expansion in credit creation, which in Japanese is shinyo sozo. But at the time was an expression that just people didn't know. And the editor came back to me and said, well, okay, I mean, your article is great, but headlines, I mean, we preserve, reserve the right anyway to write the headlines. And I mean, in Japan, they're quite good. They want the author to be on board. They don't just give you a headline as they do in English language publication. But uh, they were saying, you know, can we have something else? That because Shinyo also, you know, credit creation, you readers just will have no idea. I mean, I was trying to say, well, makes them, you know, interested. They can read what it is in my article. But they insist, no, it's something else that sort of intuitively, just looking at the headline will give them an idea. And that's when, um, quantitative easing was born because mm. in the Japanese language the I mean all this is in Japanese by the way I should I should add I mean the, the article was in Japanese and you know uh, my presentation is Tokyo of course in Japanese and negotiating with the editor is in Japanese we're talking about Japanese words and so the standard Japanese expression for stimulatory or expansionary monetary policy is literally translated means easing kanwa kanwa seisaku mm. and that's where the easing comes from. It's a literal translation of the Japanese expression. And so I use that standard expression for easing, which means expansionary monetary policy, um, and added the quantitative prefix for, um, you know, for, in order to give people the right idea that it's not going to be about the price of money. And as a result, you've got a new expression that is different from what they use for money supply, you know, M1, M2, M3. They use a completely different expression. In fact, they use the English words money supply <laughs> money supply <laughs> in japanese you know and so it wasn't that either and therefore it was a new expression that made clear okay it's not the price of money it's not interest rates it is an expansionary monetary policy but it's kind of 
and it's the quantity, but it's kind of different because we haven't used this before. So if we look at the balance sheets with the BOJ and the commercial banks, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you were proposing is that the BOJ would buy some of the toxic ass assets from the commercial banks. So then they, it would free up their balance sheet to go into the real economy and create these loans to therefore uh, give entrepreneurs the capital they need to create more goods and services and to grow the economy in a healthy way. Um, That's so a very, very, very neat way of putting it. Now, that is actually one important part um, and one of the first policies that should be taken of quantitative easing is not the whole story. I mean, essentially, quantitative easing refers to this expansion of credit creation right. in the real economy, whereby new purchasing power is created through the banking system um, that is then used um, to fund investment. <clears throat> excuse me, investment in the production of goods and services right. that add value and that also uh, implement new technologies that increase productivity and so on. And that, that's the goal. Now, there's different ways of getting there. And one important way of getting there is to, um, is to reduce the risk aversion of banks because the banks were quite risk averse by that time due to the incipient bad debts that they've been piling up. And of course, they were not yet fully declared. So a lot of people weren't really aware it was going to happen. But since 94, I had estimates of the total amount of bank loans that were going to turn sour. And it was around um, you know, 25 percent of bank balance sheets, right. which is, of course, enough to close down the banking system because they don't have that much capital. Um, the figure was for years considered far too large. By the end of the decades uh, and, and the early um, following decade, people were saying, oh, this is too small. But with hindsight, we know it was a fairly accurate figure, which was very easy to calculate. I simply looked at, of, at the 1980s, bank credit creation for non-GDP transactions, which is for asset purchases, right. uh, bank lending for the real estate sector, for construction companies, and for non-bank financial institutions. And look at the increase from roughly 1986 onwards and assume that it's going to turn sour. And there you've got your figure. So that was quite an accurate estimate. But based on that, it was clear to me that the banks, no matter what you tell them, will become very risk averse because they know themselves internally. We've got a big problem coming up here. And as a result, they just wouldn't increase bank lending. That's if you and, didn't take the toxic assets off the balance sheets. And that's exactly. So what you then need to do is, well, let's get rid of this stuff, ASAP. And of course, there's different ways you can do that. There's expensive ways. These are the ways that are usually uh, inevitably chosen. <laughs> um, the expensive ways to use taxpayers' money, get the government uh, to somehow bail out the banks or, or you know, get rid of the um, toxic assets or uh, get the government to take over banks, even as they've done in the UK. I mean, all these are very, very expensive methods mm. when actually there is a zero cost method available to do this. Yeah, the central and bank is quiet. always... This has always stunned me so much that, you know, here, here we have a zero cost method, no cost to society. We just get rid of this problem. People misunderstand. They think it's, an, it's a new problem and somehow it has to hurt at this new stage. And otherwise, you know, there's, there's something missing, you know, we're missing something. Actually, no, the problem was already in the 80s. And you, you have a huge resource misallocation that took place when banks expanded um, credit, extended credit, and therefore created new money yeah. for the purchase of existing assets. That is always unsustainable and creates problems, and it creates huge problems. So we've had these problems. Now, how do we get rid of them and solve them? Well, let's not add new problems like, oh, let's get the government to pay for this. Let's get government indebtedness blown out of proportion, have huge national debt now. Well, right. you're creating new problems on top of the old problems. Instead, we can just have a clean cut here. Okay, that's it. We've had enough of that of these problems. We get rid of these non-performing assets in the bank um, banking system through a, through a method that has zero costs, and that can be done if the central bank purchases these assets at face value, yeah. moves it onto its own balance sheet, and the story ends there. Why? What happens? Well, the banks clearly, as we see immediately, will be completely um, 
recapitalize well they, they'll be so liquid they won't have to use their capital and therefore their capital base will remain strong um you know when you have suddenly a hole on the asset side of your balance sheet this has to come normally from capital but there isn't enough capital so the banks would be bust but if the central bank purchases those non performing assets at face value then instead you have liquid assets central bank you know credits at the central bank so you've got a super strong super liquid balance sheet mm. and the banks will be very willing and very keen to expand bank credit again now you could say well hang on okay i see the benefit for the banks but what about the central banks isn't this isn't the central bank holding the bag now and the central bank will um suffer huge losses so let's say the central bank purchases those non-performing assets at 100 and they're only worth 20 there's usually some residual value i mean is this rights property rights the collateral whatever so it is true that you could represent this transaction on the central bank balance sheet as a transaction that results in a loss of 80. You know, you purchase something for 100 that's worth 20. But there's no rational reason to wish to do so. Yeah, they don't have to use market to market uh, accounts. <laughs> they don't have to mark to market, <clears throat> number one. And number two, accounts should reflect reality as much as possible. And the fact is central banks are special entities. The cost of acquiring these non-performing assets is not actually 100. You can argue the cost is zero. It's absolutely zero. It's just keystrokes. Exactly. Computer. So, therefore, what is the real gain to central banks or the real loss? Well, it's not a loss of 80. It's a gain of 20. Yeah. They now have a, a profit of 20 because they have assets worth 20 and it didn't cost them anything. Right. That will be, that's reality. Since that's reality and accounting should reflect reality as much as possible, clearly it makes no sense to book a loss of 80 when there is no real loss of 80. So that's the reality. And now you could say, okay, still, yeah, I get the logic, but surely that's so radical. No central bank has ever done that. Oh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> central banks have done this. They know how to do this. And but in particular, they know, oh, there's a banking crisis coming. If we don't want to, to get this banking crisis to turn into big economic crisis and recession, they know what to do, namely purchase the non-performing assets from the banks at face value. And the story ends there and there's no banking crisis and there's no recession. Let me give you the examples when they've done this. Look at. Japan in 19, and in fact, Japan, the Bank of Japan itself has done it. Japan in 1945. So this country had just been defeated. The testing of two different uh, nuclear devices has just taken place live on the population of Japan, the Christian population in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the two major Christian cities. Um, and of course, the argument was famously, well, to end the war, we needed this, be that as it may, certainly for Hiroshima. Uh, for Nagasaki, a week later, there was no such rationale that applied, particularly dropping that bomb um, at 11 o'clock on a Sunday when the service was about to start straight onto the cathedral in Nagasaki. Anyway, the cities were uh, subjected to the incendiary bombs, and they're mostly wooden houses, so there's not much left. So pretty, you know, destroyed country. Okay. Um, and of course, the banking system was in not a good state, as you can imagine. Why? Well, in the previous decade, the banks had been um, under guidance of the, uh, uh, the munitions ministry and the central bank, uh, being forced to extend credit to two destinations, the government, Greater East Asian Prosperity Bonds, war bonds, which didn't have much value in 1945. You could get them in flea markets. Um, they had no value anymore of a country just defeated. And secondly, uh, forced loans to the munitions industry. Now, a lot of these companies were not even in Japan anymore. Most people forget that how drastically the Japanese um, uh, geography changed in 1945. What previously was Japan had become a new nation, Korea. Korea you know, before 1945, for half a century, was part, literally part of Japan, just like Ireland was part of the United Kingdom until 1920, right? Um, and so, of course, in fact, North Korea, the, well, let me put it this way, the northern part of Korea, 
was the most industrialized area um, under Japanese control, not on the on the main islands, very industrialized area. And lots of Japanese companies were active there and had received also Korean companies and had received loans from Japan, from Japanese banks. Well, <laughs> you can forget about getting any of those loans back, of course, in 1945. They weren't even in Japan anymore. And so that was huge non-performing loans. Then, of course, there was whole, the whole issue of Manchuria, which was a, a state um, established in 1931, um, where the, the last Chinese emperor, who was Manchurian, was made um, emperor of Manchuria by the Japanese, married into the Japanese imperial family. So, you know, the Chinese imperial family has descendants, but they're in Japan. It's interesting anecdotes. If you watch that movie, you know, The Last Emperor, you'll see um, some of the um, the story surrounding that is quite well done. Anyway, so Manchuria was, you know, it was a large area. That was when the Japanese got, got, got in in 1931. It was rural, completely rural, you know, producing soybeans and things like that. But the Japanese decided to try a new economic model that they'd uh, found um, from their reading of German economics. And they decided, well, let's give this a try. And they did uh, to very good effect. 10 years later, Manchuria had become the most industrialized area in the whole of Asia, second only to Japan. Right. And lots of Japanese companies were active there. Nissan used to be called Mangyo, which is the Manchurian industrial conglomerate, um, and so on. Now, Japanese banks, of course, were lending large scale. 1945, none of that, none of that could be uh, expected to be repaid. And of course, it wasn't. So. That's the other part of the Japanese bank's balance sheet, <laughs> lending to munitions companies and, and companies in the war effort and companies that are you know, not even in Japan anymore. So that was almost entirely also non-performing. So essentially, non-performing assets were not just 25% of assets as in the early 90s. They were close to 100% non-performing assets. Now, that's, that's a really bad situation. Although in some ways it doesn't even matter. And once you're beyond 10% non-flowing assets, you know, it doesn't matter. So the story then was the Bank of Japan looked at all this vast devastation, the completely annihilated um, banking system as well, and decided, is this a good moment to have a, a banking crisis now and have a, a recession, you know, and the Great Depression on top of all the devastation that's already taken place? Maybe not. Maybe right. not. Maybe if there is a way to avoid a banking crisis and a recession, let's go for it. And of course, there was a way. So the Bank of Japan, put simply, slightly simplified, but essentially purchased the normal forming assets from the banks, not quite at face value, but significantly above market value, so much is sure. The banking system um, was therefore suddenly very strong and very liquid again. And while in the 90s, the much smaller amount of non-performing assets in the banking system created a 20-year recession, after 1945, with much larger amounts of non-performing assets, close to 100% of bank balance sheets, you know how long the recession was? Probably only one year. And then bank credit was booming again, and there was no looking back. This is the beginning of the high growth era, double digit economic growth. So the Bank of Japan knows exactly what to do. Now, it's not the only central bank, of course. The first central bank that, that did this trick was, as far as I could find, the Bank of England. Who else? <laughs> when in August 1914, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland declared war on Germany and her allies, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. I mean, that was quite a declaration of war, so it was clear it's gonna be um, a major European war. Um, the next day, the bankers came and knocked on the door of the government, senior officials and the central bank, and they said, um, sorry, we have a problem. Yes, sir, what's the problem? We're bust. Why? We've got a war to fight. I mean, it's not a time to go bust. What's happening? Well, you just declared war on all of these trading partners. And because, of course, the number one um, market for anything to do with money, stock markets, FX, 
and of course credit and loans and, and international lending, uh, you know, bills of trades, bills of exchange, international credit. Number one location was London. Of course, even the deals between Germany and Hungary and, and Ottoman Empire, you know, would often go through London. So British banks were holding what since what, what since August 9, 1914 was then declared to be enemy paper that was considered irredeemable. And therefore, that's a non-performing asset. Right. And quite a few banks therefore were bust. So the Bank of England looked at this and thought, okay, we just declared war on Germany, Austria, Hungary, Ottoman Empire. Maybe not a good moment to have a banking crisis and a long recession. So shall we not have one? Okay, let's not have one. Well, we'll just purchase all this paper at face value and we can forget about it. And that's what happened. If, if, the, if we do that now today, what would be the risk of moral hazard? Because if I'm the bank and I just basically yeah. get bailed out, I take all this risk and the Fed buys <laughs> the bad debts off my balance sheet, What's to, you know, I'd say, well, why not just do this again? I mean, they're not going to let me go bust. So why not just take exactly, exactly. Well, there's just two answers to this. Let's let's take the the one that's most relevant first. And that is what actually happened in 2008 when a lot of banks went bankrupt. Apart from Lehman Brothers, which wasn't even a bank. Um, the banks got bailed out. And therefore, nobody cared about moral hazard. That's the reality. Um, that's the revealed preference of the policymakers and central bankers. They didn't care about moral hazard. Um, but they chose, in almost all countries, the most expensive way of doing this bailout, namely using taxpayers' money. Hmm. Okay, so you're, the point is you're going to have moral hazard regardless. So you might as well do <laughs> yeah, it exactly. that way. Exactly. Exactly. Now, that's one answer. The other answer is, Actually, we don't need to have moral hazard. We can also avoid it. And that is simply done. And it's just a little added you know, uh, tweak there. We can simply do it by using the enormous power that the central bank has that moment when it says, OK, guys, you know, bring it on. We're going to buy all this paper. Wow, fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> In that moment, the central bank said, oh, by the way, you know, we have a little request here for you guys. Um, from, for, for instance, you know, the request could be, and of course, it's more than a request. Um, from now on, all bank credit has to be for transactions that contribute to GDP. And that's always been my recommended uh, policy yeah. guideline. In, in other words, only bank credit for GDP transactions are allowed and bank credit to purchase existing assets is simply not allowed. And also banks lending to specialists that do such lending are also not allowed. Um, then you would not get asset bubbles and you would not get banking crises. Um, I mean, we could, we could talk about this a bit later, but just perhaps to complete that thought, some people will say, well, hang on, that means banks are also not lending um, you know, for mortgages, what about young families? They need a house. Shouldn't they get a bank loan? Yeah, or lending. Well, actually, no. They they shouldn't get a bank loan. They should get a loan. Yes, agreed. They should get a loan. But why a bank loan? Because banks are special, and this is the trouble nowadays that nobody even understands what makes banks special. And maybe we can talk about this. But um, banks are special, and that's <laughs> that's why we have to think about when and how we use bank credit. And so in a nutshell, the proposal would be those who want a mortgage, they should get the mortgage from specialist mortgage providers that are non-bank financial institutions, don't have the power to create credit and therefore cannot create asset bubbles and banking crises. And you can set them up, they can fund themselves from bonds that banks are not allowed to purchase, but non-bank players can invest in them. So then in other words, what you do, you ensure yeah, you, well, for example, you, so you ensure that um, such you know, mortgage loans are funded with existing money, and then you can't create bubbles with that. The trouble is when the banks fund asset purchases, because whenever a bank gives a loan, it's always money creation. Right. But that money creation should really be reserved for productive transactions only, which is when you 
implement new technology, uh, new business ideas, you add value, you know, business investment that um, increases productivity, that sort of thing. Because then you get more goods and services, high quality things, yeah. while you also get more money, but the bo both are in balance and then you don't even get inflation. Yeah. But as soon as you create money, while you don't create new goods and services and add value, and that I'm afraid includes asset purchases because uh, they don't add value. We'll come to that. Um, you know, as soon as you you do that, you get asset inflation, you get uh, consumer price inflation, you get unsustainable developments, which will eventually cause trouble. So that's the story. And and there was one exception to what I said earlier. There was one central bank in 2008 that did take my advice which was my advice from Japan from the 90s. There was one guy, one academic, there's quite a few academics that took part in this debate in, on Japan in the 90s. There was Joe Stiglitz, but there was also somebody called Ben Bernanke from, from Yale, I believe. And um, he, no, Princeton, sorry, Princeton, I think. <laughs> okay, you know better than me. Um, and he uh, participated in this debate and he seemed to listen to what I was saying that you just need to purchase the non-performing assets from the banks at face value through the central bank and make sure bank credit expands again. Because the Federal Reserve in 2008 was the only central bank, as far as I could tell, that did just that. Hmm. It purchased non-performing assets from the banks and it worked like magic. A few years later, two years later, bank credit was booming again, four, five, six percent bank credit growth. And therefore, the fastest recovery after the 2008 um, setback. Of course, there's countries that never had a recession because their banking system consists of, um, you know, 80% community banks. They never engaged in the speculation. That's Germany. So they never even had a recession. But that's a different story. Of those countries that were affected by the 2008 crisis, um, the Fed, the, the US was the only one thanks to the Fed policies of getting out very quickly through implementing that part of QE. Now, interestingly, Bernanke then, when he gave a speech in January 2009 in, in London at the LSE, my alma mater, he made the point of saying, this is not QE what I'm doing because this Japanese QE is not working. And the thing is the Japanese, and actually we haven't explained this yet. So when I put out my, sorry, we have to slightly uh, go back now to Japan my proposal was 94, 95. For years, the Bank of Japan said, oh, this is nonsense. We don't need this new monetary policy. It's gonna be fine by lowering rates. Right. They lowered rates and this is gonna work. And oh, it's not quite working just yet. I will just wait a little bit. And then why don't we re lower rates a little bit further? And you know, ultimately it's gonna work because they kept lowering rates and then it didn't work. So they had a new brilliant idea. We've lowered rates now seven, eight times. It's not working. Here's a new idea. Let's let's lower rates. <laughs> they kept doing this <laughs> for a whole decade. Okay, and then by 2000, I think it was getting too embarrassing. And then one member on their board of uh, the policy monetary policy board was saying, "Well, I heard this QE. We should try QE quantitative easing. Let's do that." And they were in a quandary because they'd already published a lot of studies arguing using fancy theoretical mathematical models that are, you know, completely uh, covering completely different planets in some different universe, you know, but not planet Earth, but, you know, you know the stuff I'm talking about. Um, and they concluded with these articles that, well, QE wouldn't work. And so they were in this quandary and they, they then decided, okay, why don't we just try the QE, but we can prove that it doesn't work. And so that's what they did in March, 2001. The Bank of Japan announced, okay, we're gonna do this QE, but it's not gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to work, they said. Um, but we'll try it just to, you know, indulge in these um, crazy guys calling for QE. But what they did was not QE. What they did was plain old fashioned monetarism. Yeah, they just added bank reserves to the accounts, right? They didn't take the bad. That's it. Uh, you got it. Assets. Precisely. Yeah. And, and, you know, what good does it do the economy if the banks have more reserves at the central bank, if nothing else changes, you know? Yeah that's all you're doing well that's not going to be helpful and so as a result it didn't really have much of an impact and so in 2006 so five years later they announced well we've tried it it didn't work so we're going to abolish it now 
And therefore, it is actually surprising that only, uh, you know, two years later in Europe and America, central banks would suddenly say, oh, we're going to do QE now. When the Japanese had actually concluded, well, officially at least, it's, it doesn't work. Well, the reason why I think it was, to, was adopted in the West was because of Ben Bernanke, and he was doing the real QE, not the fake QE. And so in his speech in January 2009 at the LSE, he was making that point. What the Japanese did was the fake QE, I'm paraphrasing, you know, he didn't put it in those terms, <laughs> um, and that didn't work. But what I'm doing is different. It's the real stuff. It's about credit. And he said, and we should really call it credit easing, which is closer to my original definition of, you know, expanding credit creation. Um, and that one is going to work. And, you know, of course, the he made, Rich, work. Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, is he didn't add that stipulation in for the banks that they needed of to course. lend for productive purposes. So what they do is they lend to hedge funds and uh, other financial institutions. And they Precisely. look around and say, risk reward, let's just go in the stock market because we got the Fed foot. Exactly, exactly. That was, um, yeah, that's that's what happened. And so, so unfortunately, while the policy was was better in the US in general because it was more effective, it wasn't implemented in the optimal way and essentially just benefited the financial sector again. And so you're just creating another asset bubble and increasing inequality and all those problems while still not really funding the the real economy fortunately of course the us has a lot of small banks community banks lending to small firms and that backbone has remained strong without that it would have been a, a huge disaster uh, but the bias towards big banks lending to for big financial speculators and asset markets had become bigger and that of course is the the achilles heel of the us financial system yeah so what we have now, and I, I've, I've given this a lot of thought, and I've heard you say that uh, before the commercial banks are responsible for creating about 97% of the, we'll call it dollars or euros, basically the, the currency units that are on the balance sheet of yep. non-bank entities in the real economy. That's kind of how I describe it. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but now what we have is the government here in the United States running, let's say, a four to five trillion dollar deficit. And a lot of those bonds end up on the balance sheet of the central bank, the Fed, which to your point, uh, doesn't take money or dollars out of the system to buy those bonds. They just create new bank reserves that are denominated in dollars. So my point is, if, if the Fed is monetizing the debt, when those checks go out of the TGA and people deposit those, those create new deposits or dollar denominated liabilities in the commercial banking system. So is that money creation? Yes, it is. It is exactly. So that's so what's been happening, particularly since um, April last year, is a different kind of QE, and there's a big difference. And and the difference, I mean, I always measure credit creation of the banking system and the central bank, and use that in my global liquidity watch report to analyze and forecast equity, bond, and um, and and FX markets in 38 countries. And last year was just amazing. I mean, everything in most countries, they were all doing the same thing. So you see the, the degree of coordination. Well, we saw that with the so-called COVID policies as well, is quite extraordinary. And they'd all switched the QE. So the big difference to QE in 2008 and 2020 was that they'd all switched to now aggressively expanding bank credit creation. So that, you know, since since May, June last year, I've been warning of the inflationary effect this is going to have. It was inevitable. Um, so it is a different policy. And the goal has been to really now boost um, credit creation, boost spending and push up prices. Um, of course, the question is, how long is this going to last and where will this end? Initially, I was thinking, well, I mean, if they certainly if they kept going at that extraordinary pace that they had in April, May, June last year, then I would have the deficit said, spending is what you're referring to the government deficit. Sorry? Spending. You're referring to the no, government. I am talking about bank credit creation, bank credit creation. Um, that is um, so essentially what happens is the central bank implemented QE in the form of um forcing the banks to expand credit creation through the ppp loans 
by well that's one way the guarantees government guarantees and and exactly um but also by purchasing um essentially by forcing the banks to expand the money creation um, and create new uh, deposits in the banking system the central bank can do that and and that's what they did uh, whereas they didn't do that at all in 2008 and of course the result you know, is increased um, spending, increased demand, and inflation. And the, the increase was so extraordinary that had that continued at that pace, then we would have talked about um, hyperinflation starting maybe later this year. But we're not there. Fortunately, they, they reduced this uh, pace drastically. Although this hyperinflation scenario, I don't think is completely off the table. Yeah. Um, inflation is now out as an as an issue, and will I think will stay with us. Um, but it is a policy variable. It now depends on what they're going to do next. So one has to watch this very carefully. It's certainly one of the options because we have all this debt, this national debt, in so many countries, and high inflation is one way of just getting rid of that and also um, ushering in a reset in the financial system. And of course, you know. The great reset is in everyone's mouth and uh, is one of the things that um, certainly certain players are aiming for on a global scale with uh, a new monetary system centered on um, currencies. They're not really currencies, but are really control tools. Yeah, it's like surveillance yeah. and control tools, the so called, yeah, they call it digital SDR. Cent- well, SDRs or central bank digital currencies. Yeah. Um, which are all misnomers, really, because, um, you know, when you talk about CBD, uh, CBD, central bank uh, digital currencies, CBDCs, then it suggests like it's something new. But of yeah. course, we've had um, BDCs, bank digital currencies, for decades. That's the money we're using is actually bank digital currency. Sure. So really what's happening is central banks, which are bank regulators, are now saying that well they're not saying it that what the, what they're um preparing to do is they're about to step into the arena despite being um bank regulators mm. they now want to compete against the banks right by offering retail accounts to the public That's this right. is quite extraordinary quite extraordinary and of course to hide this they call it something geeky like you know central bank digital currencies yeah, it's, it's basically the, all the entities in the private sector, the individuals and the businesses have an account now with the Fed. So the Fed can turn those bank reserves uh, into legal tender or the people can actually spend bank reserves in the real economy where right now uh, there's that transfer mechanism of the commercial banks. Uh, I, I want to go back just, just so I'm clear here. Let's just assume for a moment that, that commercial bank credit expansion or, or was flat. And let's say the, the government came out and spent uh, a, a trillion dollars. So in order to get the money in the TGA, which is the liability of the Fed, uh, they had to sell those bonds. Those bonds were not sold to the general public. So the dollars did not come out of the private sector to begin with. Let's just assume that those uh, bonds were sold directly to the Federal Reserve. So those go onto the asset side of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. They create the bank reserves out of nothing. That's a liability that goes into the TGA. And then let's say Janet Yellen takes that uh, trillion dollars and sends out checks to, let's say, stimulus checks to individuals. They deposit them into Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase. So now the banking system has a trillion dollars in additional dollar-denominated liabilities. And then the offsetting um, uh, asset would be the TGA tran- or the Fed really transferring the, that trillion in bank reserves from the TGA onto the reserve accounts that Wells Fargo, B of A, or Chase has with the Fed. So the, the way I see it, that would create an additional trillion dollars circulating in the real economy, but yet bank uh, credit expansion would have been flat. Am I understanding yes. that correctly? Yes, so that is a separate mechanism to the one I mentioned earlier. Okay. That's right. That's also possible. And in fact, that is, I think the reason why this is encouraged 
has partly to do with these CBDCs because right. increasingly what we see is, you know, the central bank becoming, I mean, stepping out and becoming like a normal bank that's dealing with the public. Right. This is really what's happening. And of course, when you have the, the bank regulator that can easily make life difficult for banks, obviously, and they have been over the last uh, decade or so, becomes a bank, a, a player competing against the others. You know, that's on a level playing field. What's going to happen is the banks will start to disappear. They'll be forced to merge. And of course, this happened. Uh, this has happened in the last 15 years already because of uh, increased regulatory pressures and burdens and costs. And on the other hand, also the interest rate policies, you know, zero and negative interest rate policies as the ECB has been pursuing are killing banks. Right. So they have forced to merge uh, because traditional bank lending, you know, with a flat yield curve on an inverted yield curve just doesn't make sense. Uh, only the speculative lending then makes sense. Yeah, right. And so, right. and so you get fewer banks and, and, you know, banks are dying. This is what's happened in the U S and, and the Eurozone in the Eurozone. Um, since the ECB started business, 5,000 banks have disappeared. Mm. Yeah, and, and a similar figure in the US. And if they go back to a central bank digital currency where Jerome Powell can issue auto loans and mortgages, <laughs> let's say, how, how, do you exactly. compete, how do you compete with a bank that, to your earlier point, can have negative equity? Well, exactly. There's, yeah, you can't. Yeah, so you can't now, compete. So, so really what we're heading for is, is the Soviet system. Yeah. You know, the Soviet Union had, certainly during a key period in its history, had only one bank. Goes bank. Yeah, so Stalinist, bank. Stalinist. I want to be clear. Stalinist Russia. I've heard you talk about this, and this is actually where yeah. I wanted to take the conversation next. That's right. Under Stalinism, there is because you know Stalinism is about total control and and centralized totalitarian power right. and control over people. In that system, what you want to have is just one central bank that controls all financial you know transactions essentially. And of course, in those days, I mean. You know, Joe Stalin had very crude methods available to him. Nowadays, it's much more fun to be a you know totalitarian dictator because you can actually use high tech to fine tune your dictatorship. Right. And with right. central bank digital currency, you know, it's not really money. It's not really a currency. It's a control tool. Mm -hmm. You can you can switch it on and off completely selectively, not just by person, but also by by the type of shopping they're doing. And, you know, maybe this this um, product is okay, but not that product, you know. Yeah. Will be tailored to you for your benefit, probably, using AI or maybe something else. <laughs> but um, it, it will all happen. That's the trouble. And that's why, yeah, we, we need to be very much aware of these developments and, and try, to, try to stop them. Yeah. I think because the central banks can have negative equity, therefore they can loan to people based on anything they want. Uh, they don't necessarily have to consider uh, their credit worthiness. Um, I'm concerned that in the future, we'll see most of the lending uh, being based on a social score instead of uh, a credit score. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yes, I mean, that's the system that we have to some extent in China in some version. Mm. Uh, companies in particular being um, evaluated in this way in China. Um, and I suppose, you know, the, the controllers and central planners in Europe and America have been very jealous of China. <laughs> so, um, you know, they look there and say, oh, we wish we could do this. Well, how can we engineer for this to be done here too? And so, yeah, that's what they, they'd love to introduce. Um, but all of these things should be done out in the open. They should be discussed. There should be democratic debates and then votes on this like is this what we want i mean do we want a stalinist system yes or no let's have a vote on it <laughs> but that's not happening and that's the devious thing you know the sinister thing and does the centralizing go one step further with a, a digital sdr because i I've, I've listened to the imf and the world economic forum and how they're pushing for the sdr to have uh, to be the global reserve asset on central banks balance sheets uh, instead of gold or dollars or something else. So now you're dealing with, with at least with the central bank digital currency, you've got competing central banks. But if you go to that system, then there's, there's just one group and they're not elected. So how, how do you see that? 
Uh, well, I think it's the natural corollary. Once you agree to central bank digital currencies, then it's a small step to say, well, let's link them all up in some way. Yeah. And then, you know, SDR would be one way to do that. They could call it something else or, you know, um, or use the BIS instead of the IMF. It almost doesn't matter. It's, it's just a natural step that follows once you agree to this totalitarian control with um, central bank current accounts. Yeah. that are called CBDC. I'm, I'm by no means a Bitcoin maximalist, but I do really love the philosophy behind Bitcoin and sound money and decentralization. So I know one of the arguments for Bitcoin from the people who really understand it is that it, it, it takes the, the money system out of the government and out of the commercial banking system because everyone can carry it just basically on their, uh, on a thumb drive. So therefore lending wouldn't be even in the control of the banks. It can be from individual to individual. So, uh, I mean, that takes decentralization to a whole new level, uh, going the opposite direction of a central bank digital currency. So is, is that one, uh, you know, one counter argument or is that something where we should be, or something that we should be optimistic about if we value freedom and liberty? In principle, yes. I mean, you, you are, um, you know, heading in the right direction because the, the centralization is the problem, right? And that's the trend that's being pushed further and further centralization of power and decision making and control tools. Uh, and by the way, one more angle is this, when you have only one central bank, and you have no more banks, which is, you know, the road that, you know, some are, are wanting to go down, um, there won't be any more economic growth either, because right. there won't be um, there won't be productive credit creation. I don't see the central banks engaging in that actually. Um, and I think that explains why at the same time, we've got these stories coming up with, oh, we don't need growth. Growth is bad for the environment. You know, There's the whole climate story and uh, you know, we need to degrowth all these books on degrowth and zero growth and so on. Let's have, a, let's have a Japanese style scenario of 20 years of, well, forever zero growth. That's being pushed now. Um, but actually, just briefly on that, there is no contradiction between, you know, being environmentally sustainable and environmentally enhancing and economic growth. It's not growth that is killing the environment. That's complete nonsense. You know, growth is just a statistical fiction. It doesn't actually exist, you know. So how can it harm the environment? How can something fictional harm the environment? Yeah. What harms the environment is harmful activities like pollution and so on. But you can have growth without pollution, whereas likewise, you can have zero growth and a lot of pollution as well. So it's complete nonsense to conflate the two, right? <laughs> doesn't make sense. But anyway, so but that's the agenda that's being pushed, the centralization and ultimately zero growth and then, you know, hunger games. Um, whereas um, what we should be doing is, as you say, we should do the opposite and head towards decentralization and also maintain growth we can have very high growth in fact we should increase growth because what's been happening since the since the 1970s is that they've pushed down growth rates in so many countries artificially saying oh it's because of uh, you know aging society um fertility rates going down these are all policy variables they've been pushing hard to reduce fertility you know with many techniques and methods um and oh you know we you know the uh, potential growth rate has declined in America and Europe. It's just very low, one, two percent. It's all nonsense. It's all not true. Potential growth in the US can be every year 10 percent. You know, you can realize that and make it real if you have the right policies. I can certainly, um, you know, put together the policies to get 10 percent economic growth in almost any country. And that's true in Europe as well. So what what they've been doing is they've artificially been suppressing growth and Therefore, we've lost enormous amounts of potential wealth. And, and, you know, those that have not benefited from the recent, you know, asset market booms, they could have been doing much, much better than they have, because we've had this artificial low growth scenario. So we should head for decentralization and maintaining high growth. Now, how can we do that? And that's why I see some limitations with Bitcoin, because it doesn't directly link to economic growth. I think, you know, it's good to have alternative systems and decentralized systems. So that's good. By all means, use them. But we need something on top of that that gives us prosperity and the creation of new money linked to the implementation of new productive uh, activities. 
Um, and there's two things um, I'm proposing on this front. And one is to create local small banks. Community banks, small banks are the ones that lend to small firms. Small firms are the ones that are the biggest employer in every country. And also they're the ones that create new jobs. Now, small firms essentially get only credit from small banks. And that's what we need to set up. And that has the advantage of also being um, accountable organizations. If you have a small local bank, there is a chance to hold that bank to account and the bank board and the decision makers. Any organization, human organization that gets too large becomes out of control. And you know, even regulators can't control these big banks. And a bank that keeps so, their, 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 the debt on the balance sheet. The yes, case, the, the that's right. Exactly, exactly. And with, with small banks, local banks, the advantage is also that, um, I mean, certainly if you set up a system like that, Germany has a system like that, they only lend locally. Right. So then a bank is forced to really think hard. You know, we only have this district here. That's our turf. And that's our area. We can only lend here. Well, what can we do? How can we help the businesses here? How can we help, you know, even create new businesses, you know? Bankers get very creative when you put them in this environment. They're essentially in the same boat as the small firms in their area, and then they will support them. Yeah, all that the works very well. Are, all the incentives are aligned. It, exactly. In, in this scenario, Richard, how? So we're talking about the uh, lending, uh, productive lending, from the standpoint of of the bank and having the capacity to do so. But how important is uh, are the balance sheets? In the private sector that the bank of the individuals and entities the bank could possibly lend to so what what i mean by that is if you know if they're levered to the hilt then even if we set up the small commercial banks they're 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 not gonna have anyone to lend to uh without taking enormous amounts of risk and then on that note how important is the regulatory environment because if you had that structure in in communist russia as an example uh, with no private property, then it wouldn't do any good. Or with taxes, I, I think that could be an issue uh, as yeah, well. Yeah. It's, it's like all these cross currents need to be considered. Yes, yes, but it's not rocket science. It's actually not very hard. I mean, the first point about you know who can they lend to? Well, if if all the existing companies are already you know loaned up to the hilt, then um, you know, then it will be younger companies, new companies, and they're, they're always being created. I mean, the, the number of small firms is in the millions in every country, literally millions of them. Um, and, and so there's never been a shortage of that. Uh, the regulatory environment is important. America has an advantage there because um, the small banks have their own regulator and they don't have to meet the Basel capital adequacy rules, which is makes perfect sense. You know, can you imagine what's what's happened, what's been happening in Europe, in Europe, where the this is where we have most uh, mostly small banks, tiny banks, local banks. Mm. You know, in Germany, eighty percent of the banks are these small banks, right. local banks, and yet the Basel uh, rules set up by the central bankers are being applied to all of them. So the tiniest German credit union with 10 staff has to meet the same rules and requirements as Deutsche Bank with 2000 compliance staff and you know writing all the regulatory reports they need to fill in so you can imagine for the last you know 15 years since they introduced the new rules Basel 3 and so on um have been on the on the way of introducing them well um they've suffered and they've been forced to merge so they've been killing them by not having a separate regulator and and much laxer rules that is suitable, proportionate to the size. And at the same the tax time, point, yeah. the curve. Yeah, exactly. Now, the tax point is also valid. I mean, essentially, we can have, once you have the right system that delivers high growth, you can have very low tax rates. And, you know, you almost don't need taxes because there'll be so much prosperity. The government will have so many sources of revenue. Um, so the important thing is to create the right high growth system, which is quite possible. Um, and and then the tax question will be uh, will be solved easily. Let's um, highlight some examples, Richard, to, that really back up yes. this point. So okay. I, I, well, I've here, heard you talk about yeah. Germany having uh, just they're an uh, export powerhouse, and I've I've heard you give some statistics on that. I think that would blow people's mind, and that's a great example of how powerful those SMEs actually are on a global scale. 
And so if we give them capital, how that will make society richer by producing more goods and services. Yes, you exactly. also used an example of China. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. A few decades ago. So I, I think people yes, would love exactly. to Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Let's do that. Let's do exactly that. Well, which is the country that has, I think it's the largest number of billionaires per capita of the population. And I think it's Germany. It's certainly one of the ones which the largest number, I think it's the, the ones with the largest number per capita of billionaires. And these are all owners of former SMEs that became so successful, global exporters, that of course, you know, it's 100% owned by the families, all small family businesses. That's how you become a billionaire, you know. So why are these German small firms, family businesses so successful? Well, first of all, let me illustrate the success. Um, Germany has a lot of exports. For many years, Germany had more exports in total size than China, a country with a population that's, what, 30 times larger than Germany. Um, so that's quite a success. But a huge part of those exports are from tiny, unknown, small firms, family businesses. Right. How is that right. possible? SME, small, medium-sized enterprises. They account for such a huge chunk of German exports. It's mind-blowing. Now, somebody studied this and... Essentially, what they did is they looked at the most successful German small firms, SMEs, and they defined the success as being the number one player in their market niche or number two or number three. So the top three, like, like in the Olympics, you know, gold, silver, bronze. So if you have global market share, number one, two or three, then you're a champion. And because you're a small firm, this is they only did this for SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. As a result, the, there's no brand recognition. These are unknown names. So they call this hidden champions. So these are that's the definition of hidden champions. And then they did an international comparison. So how many hidden champions are there in each country? Right. Now, America is one of the strong players in this. Uh, there's 320 hidden champions in America, which is very good. It's the second highest figure in the world. The highest is Germany, which has 1,500, which is head and shoulder above anyone else. If you look at the graph, you know, everyone else is around 50, 60 um, or less, something like that. Um, How is that possible? It's because of the banking system. That's also why America is doing not so badly on this count, because it has a lot of small local banks, community banks. In Germany, we have a much larger um, amount of community banks per capita um, and you know 80 percent of banks are local community banks in Germany and they only lend locally so they lend they know their local players their local small firms when there's a new technology and this is really what it's about when we look at productivity and, and productivity simply is being able to implement the latest technologies you don't have to invent them you just need to implement and adapt them for your commercial purposes. And um, of course, this is also done by specialists, but every small firm therefore has, you know, they get offers like, oh, we can upgrade this now to the latest technology. Well, what's stopping them? Money, of course, it's expensive to upgrade to the latest technology in your process is expensive. But in Germany, they just go to their bank, they explain, look, this is the latest technology. We want to stay champion number one two market share in the world we've got to constantly upgrade and the bank looks at it and says okay here's the loan we'll do it and that's that works best in germany as a result they are most productive and most successful and they have the largest number of hidden champions and china and and, and, and okay so there's china. china now china is great because earlier we talked about the soviet union and of course the chi the chinese system was originally based you know, under Mao, Chairman Mao, it was based on the Soviet Union. It was a Soviet-style system. Now, after him, essentially by 1978, a new leader um, came to power called Deng Xiaoping. And he was a very smart guy. Um, one thing is he hated ideologies and, and just you know, empty words. He was, he was interested in reality and in delivering results. So he was a very pragmatic guy. Now he looked around and he decided, well, the Soviet model isn't really that successful, let's face it. 
but I look I look across the water here and, and, and I see Japan is is phenomenally successful mm. by 78 you know Japan was really uh, beginning to challenge the US right and how did they do that well he knew how to find out about that you know if you want to find out secrets in Japan just go to Japan you meet people you have lunch you have dinner make sure there's a bit of sake in the game <laughs> um, in, in Deng Xiaoping's uh, case I think there was also some multi being drunk when he visited Japan in 1978 and he found out because they will always tell you the truth in Japan it's but only informally off the record over dinner and they told him hey we've got these you know literally thousands of banks small banks local banks regional banks secondary regional banks credit unions you know whatever savings banks they lend to small firms that's how we do it they're very productive we generate massive growth that's how we get 15 percent economic growth mm -hmm. and the central bank guides this by making sure the banks don't lend to unproductive purposes for consumption or for frivolous stuff or for asset purchases the central right. bank has intervention where it just simply checks the bank lending as it no you can't do the speculative lending financial asset lending no it has to be productive business investment lending okay right and they called this window guidance by the way so Deng Xiaoping went back and and told his people this is how we're going to do it I see Japan successful Germany is doing the same and also the US although there's no you know as we know uh, not much of the the guidance happening but the structure of the banking system is also highly diversified thousands of small banks mm. let's have that and so he departed from the Soviet monobank model. Right. And he created under his command, and they created thousands and thousands and thousands of banks. At the, at the moment, the country with the second largest number of banks in the world is China after the US. And what was the result? Well, the rest is history. You know, since he did that, economic growth really took off. We had four decades of double digit economic growth. And more people were lifted out of poverty than anywhere else in any any time before in history. Mm. So that was highly successful. And it's, it's due to creating many, many banks, small banks, local banks, community banks that lend to small firms. So it works very well. Um, and I think that's what we need to do. Now, there is one way in which we can you know, push for this decentralization and also use the, the latest technologies in, in the sort of cryptocurrency world and this is something I'm looking at with uh, some of my colleagues. And essentially what we're, what we're working on doing is, because you know, I'm engaged in setting up community banks, Hampshire Community Bank, Norfolk Community Bank, other community banks. Um, also in other countries, we're looking at this yeah. in continental Europe and beyond. And the idea is we're going to issue tokens for people to participate in this and also to help um, you know, get this going. And these are essentially governance tokens where you can, you know, you can make a decision for an autonomous, you know, entity, DAO, and um, you can essentially then get a say over certain types of banks that you want to see being created. Mm. Um, one could even pull it down to the level of, you know, what types of sectors should receive loans and so on. So, um, you know, essentially people would get some, some voting power and decision-making power in this um, and be involved, you know, by backing these tokens. Uh, but the idea is essentially to set up a whole lot of these banks. Right. And yeah. that puts power back into the hands of the local communities, you know, and the money creation power is given back to the people to whom it belongs. Yeah, that's right. That's the key. So for those people who really value, you know, freedom, liberty, but also want to see the standard of living increase for society at large, especially for the poor and middle class. Uh, this is something that we all need to be thinking about, we all need to stand up for. And then, and then but I also think we need to be cognizant of the push towards this mono bank, as you described, yeah. it, because we do have a lot of the central planners a lot of the politicians, the IMF, the World Economic Forum that are pushing in this direction. So we need to combat that by doing the opposite and going to taking this DeFi approach exactly. With, uh, exactly. with these smaller community banks that uh, where the incentive structure is aligned. Exactly.
That's right. Yep. All right, Richard, I, I think I kept you a little long, so I really appreciate your time. I mean, this is a fantastic conversation. I could literally talk to you for hours on end. So I, <laughs> let's I do it again. Let's do yeah, it again. I can't wait to do it again. But for my uh, viewers and listeners who want to find out more about what you do or more about your projects with these banks, uh, where can they go? Well, one website is local-first.org org.uk local first is a community interest company a social enterprise that sets up community banks and it you know is involved in various uh, community bank uh, projects okay. established banks um, there's also some other projects but um, i mean i can be reached on my website professor werner.org um, you know we're also looking at uh, creating another type of specialized bank um, and as I said, the token, I think, is quite an exciting development because essentially the ways to let people participate in the, the profits from, from coming from that as well, which, you know, is another interesting angle. Absolutely. All right, uh, Professor, again, I appreciate your time and I can't wait to have another conversation. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye bye.